While Steve Cortez is on special assignment with the Trump campaign, filling in for Steve is Sean Thompson. I do think that talk radio has a purpose. It's it's supposed to be more than just cheerleading. And that's what I love about it. And I love the fact that we have this opportunity to speak to people who probably would shove us out of the way if they were, I was standing in front of his latte. Anthony Markham, I'm just kidding. He is an R Street resident fellow. He's written for the Washington Post, USA Today, NBC, and many, many radio outlets, including ours. So I want to thank you for joining me. I think we are at a very crucial time, and I wanted to have you uh, come in and discuss with us judicial integrity. Do we still have it? Can we save it? Are we destroying it? Well, short answer, I think there's still uh, the, the more cynical, unfortunate answer. is a lot of steps to hurt judicial independence, and frankly, no one is innocent in this. It's very easy to point fingers to the other side, depending if your T-shirt is red or blue. But there have been a lot of mistakes, I would argue, along the way. But I think there are still steps that we can take either as voters, citizens, um, pushing members of Congress and others to take a better stance to not only protect the uh, legitimacy of the judiciary, but just how our politics works in general. Anthony, I have been so uncomfortable with the idea that my freedoms basically can be decided by, you know, five people. And, uh, you know, they're undermined constantly. And I'm, I'm really having a hard time realizing I'm nothing more than a serf and was hoping that law would be that shield that the Constitution guaranteed me it would be. And uh, it appears I'm losing at every turn. And then when there is an opportunity to maybe help me or change things, it becomes so political that now we are only going to have a woman, only if she can do the merengue, and only if she thinks it's okay to have people fund things they normally disagree with wholeheartedly. I think one of the unfortunate things you see in recent politics is the increased pressure of Supreme Court confirmations. And why do you see that? We can think of the, the unfortunate passing of Justice Ginsburg, whether maybe you agreed with her jurisprudence or didn't. I think, I think people can recognize an important statue she had in the United States. And look back to her confirmation hearing um, during the 90s. Ninety-six senators voted for her confirmation, overwhelmingly bipartisan. So what happened? We can look at a slow decline of votes becoming tighter and tighter. And I would argue that's because our politics has become so dependent on the Supreme Court. We won't need five justices to answer our most pressing political and policy questions simply because our legislators refuse to do it. Either it's expedient, it's easy to blame the courts, or they're just not able to legislate themselves. And so when you get that kind of separation of powers out of whack, like I think it is right now, you're going to have so much, you're going to have so much power, authority, and imbalance reliant on nine people. And you know what I'm thinking about as you're, as you're reminiscing about uh, Ginsburg being approved to go on to the Supreme Court? That was the 90s. If I'm not mistaken, that's before we knew that Jim Baker and Jessica Hahn were more than just friends. I mean, there was a lot of Republicans were very ideologically against her, yet understood why Clinton picked her and understood her qualifications more than made her qualified to be in that position. We are never going to get that in a Trump administration when Democrats strictly, if he says yes, we say no. And the reality is if we give in and Trump loses, and I disagree with a lot of Trump's philosophies, especially economically, and Joe Biden gets in, it's going to be the person who wants to use law as a weapon. And that, as an American, offends the hell out of me. I, and, I, and I think it's it's interesting you mentioned kind of the 90s in this in this trend. And I, I'll just go back to it again, thinking of, um, you know, the current chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Lindsey Graham, senator from South Carolina, voted for both Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan. I think things like that have just been completely forgotten. And honestly, it wasn't that long ago. And so it's taken such a sharp turn. And I think you used kind of interesting um, phrase there, kind of this, this weaponization of the courts, you know, the courts, uh, we need the courts to solve every single political or policy question. If I don't like something, I'm going to, I need to run to the federal court to solve it. It's not the, it's not the way it was designed. And, you know, I can kind of put on my history professor hat and talk about Alexander Hamilton. And when they're trying to convince people to support the constitution in the first place, what did Hamilton say? 
the courts are the least dangerous branch. They don't have the sword. They don't have the purse. They just have judgment. Everything, they're reliant on everyone else. They're the weakest. Don't worry about them. And we can see how much that's changed in our modern politics. Do you think when Americans die, the first thing that happens is that the founders walk up to them and slap them in the face and say, what the hell did you do to my country? Because it feels like, I well, feel like so few of us understand that that's exactly what law is supposed to be. Right. And, you know, it's, it's funny enough, it's, you know, everything this week has been consumed by the Supreme Court. And so everyone is looking at the past and everyone's looking at the present and everyone's afraid of the future. And I'm starting to think maybe it's no coincidence that the very first Supreme Court was an even number. And maybe, and maybe that strategy was if there were ties, if there were those disputes, those questions were going to go to the other branches. The true difficult political questions should go to the political branches. And so those political actors are dependent on voters. And if the voters don't like the direction they're taking, vote them out. It's hard to vote out a Supreme Court justice that enjoys life tenure. Now, Anthony, I'm, I'm a little contrarian, and I know that. I tend to... If everyone's heading right, I kind of think, let me go in a different direction. Um, but I never liked FDR. I was well aware of what his plot was, which was to plant the seeds of socialism and the seeds of, of government-centric policies, knowing full well that they would become the forest of tyranny that they have become. So I also knew that he was going to be challenged. Back then, there was no Internet. There were no cell phones. So he understood it. I'm going to be challenged. So what I need to do is change the numbers on the court and pack it. So I'm wondering, how did that how did we change that? And how are we going to fight off, which is clearly going to be the answer if Democrats ever get in again and try to seize our economy and our lives? They're going to do the same thing. I think they're already giving us that tell now. Sure, and, I, and obviously what you're referring to was uh, FDR's plan to, to pack the courts. And, and there's a difference between, I think, um, a lot of people put packing. It's not filling current vacancies. Packing would be expanding the Supreme Court, adding seats to the Supreme Court. And that's what FDR wanted to do. He was frustrated that the Supreme Court was knocking down parts of his New Deal legislation. He wanted to expand the court by um, creating legislation in a way that uh, ju- current justices would have to retire. Those seats would be open and create a few others. And then before you knew it, the majority of members of the Supreme Court would have been nominated by FDR. And the way that was stopped was actually by institutional political pressure. Um, members of members of Congress, even of FDR's own p- party, knew it would be unpopular and persuaded them not to go forward. So it was actually the fear of people um, rejecting this idea and it being politically unfavorable. And that's the type of thing that's going to be most influential now and why it's so important to talk about um, talk about why like, court packing is dangerous, this sort of tit for tat escalation of the judicial confirmation war, is that it's ultimately damaging. And I think, unfortunately, our lawmakers are less uh, seemingly interested in doing that. And I think you know, five years ago, court packing was really an extreme notion. And the fact that you're seeing it proposed by party leaders is incredibly concerning. You know, I'm not one of these people that thinks the Constitution is a living and breathing document. I think it's ridiculous that that's even possible. Uh, I do think, however, that there should be some adaptations. I like the amendment process. I like all of this. But the idea that in 240 years ago, the average life expectancy was, what, 60 and now we have life appointments. It's the year 2020. And these Supreme Court justices can literally take advantage of that where they're OK not to perform their job for a year while they are in hospice. Uh, how, is this ever going to change where we stop letting these people go to their 100 years old before we say you're not a Supreme Court justice anymore? Yeah, and, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head for a lot of reforms that people are talking about. Not only is court packing being talked about, but. You know, there are less other there are more measured reforms that are being talked about. One of those is term limits. You know, today the Constitution says that judges have um, tenure for good behavior. What does that mean? Well, it means life tenure. And so those judges enjoy life tenure. So you would have to change the Constitution to enact it. A number of people have argued for different types of term limits. The most popular one being 18-year terms. Um, that's designed in a way that each presidential administration, every four years, there would be two vacancies. You know, the, the idea would be um, more uh, uh, more regular. It would be uh, more of a regular process. It would be more orderly. 
people, presidents would feel less inclined to nominate people at a younger age since they'd only be serving 18 terms. It would feel more definitive. Of course, there are plenty of critiques um, against the one being it would be very difficult to implement changing the Constitution and then uh, rolling it out. It would probably take uh, decades, but it's definitely one of the things being talked about, especially as our life expectancies are much longer than they were in the 1800s. Uh, You're absolutely right there. And, you know, I'm I'm familiar with Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her career, and I'm impressed beyond it's an understatement to say I'm impressed and, and, and respectful of her intelligence and her aware of all of the the, her, the level of her intellect, which brings me to my next point. Once they become a Supreme Court justice, for all intensive purposes, the way the job is described, they're literally gods among citizens. I believe full well Ruth Bader Ginsburg understood what the law said and decided intellectually to take and become an activist using that law. Is there ever going to be something in government as we watch senators and congressmen become far older than they should be to drive, yet be, continue to be our representatives? We have the same issue with the Supreme Court. Is there ever going to be a time in government when competency tests will be issued to politicians so that we make sure they have their faculties, they understand what the rules are. Why isn't this something we do every election cycle? Well, I think the, I think the biggest argument against it would be let the, let the voters determine that competency. And you know, as frustrating as that answer can be, I think that's typically the answer you would get for, for elected positions. And for the House every two years, the Senate every six. I think what would be the most important way is increased scrutiny of their candidates and not what political party they are. But what are their what are their senators doing for them? What are their members of the House doing for them? What are they actually doing for them? Forget the party line votes, forgetting about the ability to fundraise. Are they working for their districts? Are they working for their state? And of course that's incredibly different than at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, they don't have a constituency. Mm-hmm. They have life tenure. Um, they have a, enormous influence and power. The tough thing about the Supreme Court is, you know, a lot of the justices disagree a lot, and they agree a lot, but they have many, many different approaches. Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Gorsuch, both nominated by President Trump, both conservative justices, have disagreed a bunch in just two years. There's so much nuance and complexity to it all. So it's it's difficult to say for justices, and um, I'm a lawyer, and often the frustrating answer is it depends, but it depends. And I think for elected positions, I think it's increased scrutiny by voters. You know, I want to ask you a little bit more about what's been happening with COVID, but we have to go to a commercial break. I'm go- I really want to ask you where the lawyers have been during this time when politicians have seized our freedom. So think about that, because I'm interested in the answer, and we'll be back. If you don't mind hit- hanging with me, Anthony, can you do that? No problem. We'll be back back with Anthony Markham after this. Clap your hands, everybody, if you got what it takes. Got Curtis Blow, Curtis Blow, and words. I want you to know that Anthony's like, what the hell the is words. going on? <laughs> Anthony, thanks for sticking around. So, you, yeah, thanks for having me. So we're in Illinois, right? We've got this Governor Pritzker. He's a trust fund baby, but he's loaded to the gills. So he buys the governorship. Buys it. And that's kind of where politics is now. The more money you have, the better your odds are, inundate people with propaganda, and the buffalo run off the cliff. Everybody does it, right? So here we are, and I'm thinking the whole time, okay, well, it's going to be bad, and it's going to be disastrous financially, but ultimately, the law will come to my rescue and will save me. And then COVID happens. And I feel like lawyers said, "Ah, I'm sorry, all of that stuff only existed prior to the so-called pandemic, where I don't even have the right to disagree anymore. Now, I have a couple of little businesses. I can't go open my door. They take my license because I really don't have a license. It's just a fee they charge me, you know, to pretend I have a license. Because what this proves is you don't own anything. I don't have the right to my own property. And as far as that goes, when I leave my house, I am forced to put something on my body, which I think there should be no force in government, in the American government. You can't convince me of it. I should always have the right to disagree. Am I just old-fashioned? Well, I, I think, ironically, you bring up an interesting point. With how many decisions and influence that comes from D.C., one of the things that seems throughout, throughout our nation's history that has been consistently reserved to the state are these types of emergencies. 
Oh, uh, the phone's breaking up. Oh, I apologize. Can you hear me? Just now go? I can. Now I can. Go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. So <laughs> kind of one of the great ironies in how much influence D.C. has, um, limiting what governors can do when it comes to health codes and state emergencies, it's still one of those things they can't touch. And I think you see, obviously, a drastic difference in states and counties and cities. You know, I'm, I currently live in Maryland. The rules are much different from where I grew up in the Midwest. And, you know, Illinois has different rules than what's happening in Texas and elsewhere. And so it's one of those things, frustrating as it is, our local officials have a tremendous amount of power still. And lawyers, I think, um, who are frustrated with these sort of provisions, especially for small business owners, are doing their best, but sometimes their hands are still tied. And isn't there a takings clause issue? I always thought there would be a takings clause issue with this. I thought some lawyer would come up and say, look, you've taken these people's livelihoods, you've seized their businesses, you've shut them down from making money, and your, your option, the government's option to me is, well, we're going to make it easier for you to take debt. But I don't want that. I just want to work. I'm shocked at the lack of attorneys. You know, I turn on the TV. They want to sue everybody for bumping into somebody in a McDonald's parking lot. It's $100,000 to slip and fall. Attorneys, come on, sue this guy, sue that guy. I can't find anybody actually trying to put a suit forward against a government that's done this to small business. Oh, yeah, and, I, and I think what you're, what you're suggesting is that the idea that the government is taking your opportunity to, to earn a living and to make money, they're effectively taking your opportunity to do that, and there should be compensation for it. You know, kind of, one of the unfortunate things with lawyers as a profession, we're not as creative as you would think. I'm trying to talk so you into a case here, Anthony. I want you, I, I'll be your client. You be my guy. Let's sue everybody. <laughs> if only if I were barred in Illinois. Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of creative arguments. And it's one of those things that, you know, kind of sit and steal down. And, you know, and sometimes the most creative arguments win. The thing that hasn't been tried before is often the thing that is successful. So uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Maybe there's a sympathetic court or judge out there. But it is, it's, it's an interesting argument. It's a creative argument. And the beauty is there's not just one constitution. There's a state constitution. And so there are different state and federal laws. And sometimes what doesn't work in federal courts works in your state. So, you know, it's funny, I'm reading the, the, your article, and it says judicial integrity. So in Illinois, Chicago specifically, it's a, we got, it, there is no judicial integrity. They're all, they're all Democrats. They all play the game. They're all in that mafia organization and the money. So you really have nowhere to turn. You know, the only answer I can come to to my own questions is lawyers understand the futility in fighting this, this organization that is so secured in a state that is completely taken over there is no such thing as a republican party in illinois they're just democrats that are better dressed from brooks brothers same thing so you know a citizen like me and there are many of us here in illinois we don't feel there there is any integrity in um you know our state judicial system we had hopes in the in the federal but when you even hear your side brag we you know we stuck so many guys who think just like us the reality is can human beings at this day and age, in our political climate where it is simple, you are either on one side or the other, we can't agree on common ground. Don't you think it's just an inevitable loss of, of integrity by this, you know, in the opinion of the citizens in a, in, a, in a country like Venezuela and in the direction we're going where we're just going to not even bother anymore? You know, one of my greatest fears, and you kind of mentioned the phrase judicial integrity, which I've used before in things, in things I've written. You know, when it comes to the courts, there is a worst case scenario. And, you know, and, and the power of the courts really is its influence, its, its judgment, the, the assumption that people will obey its orders. The worst case scenario is when you run into a time where because the integrity or trust in that judicial system is at such a low, there's no penalty for disobeying them disobeying an order for not listening to a court and without it you really have the destruction of the rule of law once you get to that point so when you know people talk about hypothetically the legitimacy of the judiciary and judicial integrity i think that actually means something it matters because there's a worst case scenario you know politicians can be hypocritical and you can vote them out and there should be penalties you know usually it's to kick them out of office for judges it's far more difficult and so that's why we have to be incredibly careful about who becomes judges, how these courts are structured, and, and doing everything we can to maintain that people still have faith in the system. Tony, I want to thank you so much for joining me. I'm sorry I called you Tony. Your name is Anthony. But, you know, I've been Norm Crosby and you the entire 
uh, interview. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Uh, where can people find your, your stuff? Sure. So most of my work, you can find it on our website at rstreet.org, letter rstreet.org. I'm also on Twitter at Anthony W. Markham. All right, I'm going to friend you on Twitter now, and I want to thank you so much for joining me. And if you don't mind, come back after uh, the big decision so we could talk about the blowback and how it's going to look for the riots and what side it will be the uh, base of what party. Do you mind? Not at all. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Anthony Markham, we'll be back with your calls after this.